it is, uh, well, 12.01 over here uh, in the Eastern US. You might be in a different time zone. But um, yeah, I'm Yeni. I'm the founder and CEO of Kari Prehab. And once again, uh, very happy to have you all here. Thank you so much for, for, joining, for joining us today. And um, these seminars are really uh, a way primarily for us to be able to connect with our with our community. So it's so nice to see so many so many faces here. And um, we also want to provide some tangible takeaways, some actionable information for you in these seminars um, that you can implement right away into into your wellness routine and your and your self maintenance routine. So um, hopefully you'll find this information uh, useful and relevant to you. We also want to thank you for being a part of our community. Um, so we are offering a discount code for you guys if any of you want to explore our other programs that we have on our website. They include um, everything from mobility and nervous system recovery, guided relaxation, myofascial release. Um, um, and I'll go ahead and pop that code in the chat for you right now, but it's also going to be in a follow-up email that you'll receive from us this afternoon. So if you don't grab the code now, you will certainly have an opportunity to come back to it later. Now, uh, these sessions are by their very nature kind of more general, like the information that we're giving out is more broadly applicable. Um, but if you find that this information feels uh, extra relevant and applicable to you, then I wanted to also mention that we do have um, our strength training and yoga for osteoporosis program launching in early 2023. So if you or somebody that you know feel like you could benefit from that, then we would obviously love to be able to get in touch with you and tell you more about that as it's coming up. Um, you had the opportunity to opt in when you signed up for this webinar to receive news and updates from us. So if you did that, you'll already be signed up to receive all of those um, upcoming news. But uh, if at the end of the seminar you decide, oh, I should have signed up for news and updates, then um, there's going to be a link in that follow-up email as well where you can sign up for the newsletter to uh, make sure that you're receiving those that information when it, when it comes out. <laughs> So that will all be in the follow-up email along with the recording of this session. Um, as far as the logistics for our time together today, um, Michaela and Sarah, who I'll introduce in just a moment, are going to start off with some lectures, some basic information um, about some of the considerations that we want to have in mind anytime we're moving and strength training when there is an osteoporosis or osteopenia diagnosis. And after that, we'll head into a practice component. So if you want to move with us and do the practical component, you're welcome to do that. If you want to just observe and come back to it later or pass it on to somebody else, you're more than welcome to do that as well. So you don't have to do it with us, um, but you're welcome to. And if you do want to participate in the practice component, we recommend having a few props to hand, and those will have been listed in your emails that you received from Eventbrite as well. So that includes um, yoga blocks, blanket or a pillow, um, a yoga strap or some sort of like belt or resistance band, or even a dog leash would work as well. And then optionally some weights. And I think Michaela and Sarah can talk you through what those might be. It could be like household implements as well and then a chair someplace close by. And um, there's a lot of substitutions that you can make for these props as well. So you'll be able to do a lot of this even if you don't have like every single one of those of those items. And then we're gonna finish out with plenty of time for Q&A so we can discuss all the information and answer any questions that you might have about it. You're welcome to drop any of your questions throughout the session into the chat. And if you have any like logistical questions about what's happening, I'll be monitoring that, so I'll do my best to answer those as they come in. Um, anything a little kind of uh, juicier or relating to the content <laughs> of the seminar and Michaela and Sarah's expertise, we'll leave those for the Q&A at the end so they can answer that in, in a lot more detail. Um, and then finally, I want to introduce your hosts, Michaela and Sarah, today. They'll be uh, carrying the rest of the, of the session. Uh, Michaela Smith is one of our coaches here at Kari. She is a yoga medicine therapeutic specialist at the 500 hour level. So she understands anatomy and physiology and biomechanics on a really deep level. She's also a NASM certified personal trainer. Um, she has a degree in nutrition and this very in-depth but broad specialty in lifelong fitness and women's health. So she is definitely the right person to be leading this session. And I was delighted when she said that she would be willing to do that. Um, and then Sarah, Dr. Sarah Avery um, is a doctor of physical therapy, and she's also a yoga 
teacher at the 200 hour level. So it brings a wealth of experience and expertise with that very um, long lasting specialty in working with osteoporosis uh, patients as well. And uh, Michaela and Sarah actually lead in an in-person osteoporosis strength training program in their hometown in uh, Saratoga Springs in uh, upstate New York. So this is a really exciting um, time for us here at Kari and for Michaela and Sarah because um, we're essentially looking to expand their very popular in-person offering into a digital hybrid format um, that allows anybody anywhere in the world to participate in the program while still having this personalized uh, guidance and support from Michaela and Sarah all the way through. So um, without any further delay, I'll hand it over to Michaela and Sarah. Please go ahead and take it from here. Excellent. And so hi, everybody. I'm going to um, screen share. We made a little presentation for you. So let me just um, pull that up and then we can get going on our um, our presentation here. All right. Yes. Thank you for the introduction, Yanni. And thank you all for spending your Saturday morning, afternoon with us, whatever time it is for you. Um, Again, I'm Sarah Avery. Um, I have been working in women's health for quite a few years now, and I'm honored to be bringing this program to you uh, virtually and being able to talk a little bit more about osteoporosis. So um, we can go ahead and get started just talking about what osteoporosis is. So some really important statistics are that osteoporosis sadly affects 55% of the population ages 50 and older in the US. So of course, this is most common in women who are postmenopausal just because of the fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone and those decreases. Um, of course, that uh, the risk for osteoporosis increases as you age as well. So in that uh, demographic of people, we find that compression fractures, and I'll explain that in a moment, affects 25% of those postmenopausal women in the United States. So again, this one continues to increase, reaching 40% of that population 80 years or older. So what compression fractures are, just briefly, is when and a compression fracture can happen throughout any part of the body, but most commonly affects the spine. So you have these vertebral bodies of the spine, and that's basically, if you see a spine model, it's the really thick, chunky piece in the center of the spine. So in a normal, healthy posture, we want to distribute forces around that bone equally. So if over time, your posture, you begin to hunch forward, you're actually putting a lot more pressure on the front of the vertebrae. So over time, and that repeated pressure will actually stimulate more bone growth in the front of the spine. And if that spine continues to grow, you'll create what's called osteophytes, and those are little bony outgrowths. And if you stack osteophytes on top of each other and keep bending forward, that's what a compression fracture is, is when those little pieces of bone fracture. So that doesn't sound wonderful. It doesn't sound like it's, you know, it really impacts quality of life. So we want to prevent that as much as possible and early on. And then, the, of course, there are a number of factors that can also contribute to bone density. So certain medications, lifestyle habits, such as sleep and nutrition. And some people have unique conditions where they have other diseases that can cause um, more bone loss. So just to dig a little bit deeper into what happens to the bone. So over time, um, bones become porous and that's what osteoporosis is, that's right in the name. So those bones will become fragile and this is due to two underlying cells in the bone. So you have this really nice um, system that happens in the body where bone is laid down, but also absorbed. So it's the cycle that happens. Osteoblasts are the cells that actually lay down bone and they are, they lay down bone when they are stimulated by something. So something such as weightlifting and pressure. The osteoclasts are cells that come in and absorb bone. So they're kind of like the ones that come in and sweep up all of the decayed bone. So what happens in osteoporosis is your osteoclast activity is higher than the osteoblast activity. 
So you could see how when osteoclast activity is higher, it's actually absorbing more bone than what's being laid down. So the most common sites for this to happen are actually in the wrists, which can be, you know, a little surprising because we don't hear about that as often. You can also see it in the neck. And then most common is in the lumbar spine, so in the low back and also the hips. So when you are, <laughs> so when you are getting your DEXA scan, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, um, the doctor will typically prescribe that you get the lumbar spine and the hips uh, to be examined. Okay. So Michaela is going to chat with you a little bit about what happens after a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So for many people, after you hear that you have osteoporosis or um, even osteopenia, there is a big fear response um, because that loss of bone density will increase your risk of fractures, either through those compression, compression fractures that Sarah talked about, or um, as a result of falls, because now that your bones are more fragile, falls become a little bit more serious. And this fear can cause um, people to stop partaking in the activities that they love, or even just feeling an overall anxiety about just partaking in everyday life. So it can become something that becomes a very fear-based um, moment after this diagnosis. And there are people who would prefer not to take the medications due to concerns or issues with side effects. So sometimes it can feel as if you feel stuck, <laughs> but there are there is hope. So that common fear doesn't have to be the, uh, the narration that you take into the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. So we love this, but fear not. <laughs> so you can improve or maintain your bone density naturally. So that's kind of like the bread and butter here with, with where we're stepping in and kind of filling some gaps that exist in this community. So with the right stimulus, so that would be the type of exercises that we're prescribing, the right dose, which would be the frequency at which you're performing those exercises. And of course the consistency that will help you get back to um, not only feeling confident and strong, but get you back to doing the things that you love, therefore improving your quality of life. Another thing that helps um, by doing group work like this is that you're actually finding a community of not only like-minded individuals, but people who are also going through the same experiences that you are. So it's nice to feel understood and supported within your community. Um, because a lot of times the same fears and the same questions that you have are the same fears and questions that other people have. So we're here to help wade through that. And then lastly, exercising with a professional who is a specialist in the safety protocols for um, exercise with osteoporosis will actually help you give, the, give you the confidence that you need to eventually um, branch off and maybe do some of these programs on your own at home or in the gym. Okay. So strategies for improving bone density and decreasing the risk for future fractures. There are three things that we want you to take home with this. And that is one, improving your posture to progressively loading. So we'll touch on that and then building up your balance. So the reason we want you to improve your posture is, and we just touched on that, this reduces the risk of your compression fractures because you're promoting your healthy alignment you're stacking the head over the shoulders, shoulders over the hips, hips over ankles when you're standing. So what that does is it prevents the shoulders from rounding forward. And because where the head goes, the rest of the body follows. So we want to keep the head stacked up nice and, nice and high over the spine. Second is your progressive loading of the body. I think progressive is the key word here. So even though the literature shows that you should, I don't want to say should be, but the most improvements seen in bone density are when people are consistently lifting 70 to 80% of their body weight. And that's with very specific weight lifts. Um, so don't think that that's for every exercise that we give you. However, the progressive piece comes into play because you don't want to go lifting 100 pounds, right? Right away, because you can cause other musculoskeletal injuries that we want to avoid. So the body adapts to the stresses that you put on it. So it's important to start low and gradually build up. And quite honestly, that could take two years to get you to a point where you're, where you're feeling pretty confident with, with those movement patterns. Um, so yeah, and then of course the two to three times per week um, and then 12 weeks is shown to be where those improvements start to happen. 
However, um, we don't really see those changes on paper until the DEXA scans are retested at a two-year interval. Um, and then finally, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, is building up your balance, which reduces the risk of falling. So that's that's going to reduce your risk for fractures. So I'm sure that you know there's it's it's common knowledge that you know over time our balance decreases, falls happen, and then when people fracture their hips, that actually leads to um, I, I hate to say this statistic, but it it does increase the the risk of mortality. Um, so we obviously want to avoid that and extend longevity as much as possible. So we start now working on that balance to prevent all of that from happening. Um, and then lastly, this is pretty interesting. Uh, people always say that, you know, oh my ankles are so wobbly. I'm not. I don't have good balance. But your ankles being wobbly in certain positions is actually your body's way of responding to keeping you upright. So actually thank your ankles when they're doing that. And then also know that it can take up to 10,000 repetitions to see nervous system changes in the body um, with balance. So if you do the math on that, that could take you up to two years if you're doing exercises daily. So that's one where you really want to be patient and consistent. Okay. <laughs> So if we are talking about an overall training program after your osteoporosis diagnosis, a well-rounded um, program will include these things. So we want to include a safe yoga practice that focuses more on the alignment to avoid the things that we just discussed about compression fracture, um, avoiding excessive spinal flexion and those extreme ranges of motion. So what you see on Instagram or in the yoga textbooks might not actually be the thing that's right for you. And then next is the intentional weightlifting. So intentional meaning functional. Things like lifting a laundry basket um, or picking up your groceries could seem a little scary after a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Um, but what that translates into in the gym is a squat and a deadlift. So we can teach you or you can learn from other professionals how to keep that proper alignment to do those tasks at hand. So you can be a little more confident there. Um, axial loading is an interesting one. So axial loading is where you're loading the spine from the top down. So the, con the flip side of that would be loading in a flexed position. And that again, would lead to putting too much pressure on the front of the spine. So if we're axially loading by either doing maybe an overhead press, wearing a weight vest, or even doing um, squats where you're holding weights down by your side, those are all examples of axial loading. Um, and again, posture exercises to strengthen that whole posterior chain, so behind the body, so that we can keep that chest expansion, keep the head stacked over the shoulders pretty nicely. And then just to recap on the balance exercises to strengthen and promote that proprioception, which it's a very fancy word. We won't make you remember that, but we will talk about it in a couple of slides. Okay. All right. And so um, what about yoga? So yoga is something that we include in our program. And we have found that it may improve bone density. Uh, a famous kind of survey or study is Lauren Fishman's 12 yoga poses. If you're interested, you can do a really quick Google and you'll find lots of articles that show you the exact yoga poses. Um, but what they found with that survey was that with those 12 yoga poses held for 30 seconds daily over the course of 10 years, people did find improvements in their bone density in their spine and their femur. So they're on um, thigh bones. So obviously 10 years is a really long time, but um, I think what we can take away from that study is that depending on the individual's level of adaptation, so as Sarah mentioned, your body responds and adapts to the stress that you put on it. So if you are someone who hasn't done much strength training before, um, that can make us believe that body weight training is a good way to start pulling in that sense of strength to at least get started on building some bone density. Outside of bone density, though, there's still lots of um, important things that yoga can offer um, someone with an osteoporosis diagnosis, such as that improvement in balance and coordination. So yoga offers this really safe and adaptable setting, especially if you kind of choose a a slower class, a teacher who might be more mindful of pace and offering at um, those options for 
setting you up with a good balance and practice. Um, but it offers you this opportunity to really work on your coordination, which again is going to reduce that risk of fall. So we're kind of layering this idea of back on top again and again. Um, we also get to strengthen the feet, the legs, the hips, and all of these different ranges of motion and kind of novel positions from your daily life. And what that does is that it improves our body awareness. It gives us better control in these different ranges of motion and it helps our coordination moving in and out of these different shapes, which falls tend to happen when you're in awkward positions or you're juggling too many things at once. Um, so having practiced moving through something like that in a yoga setting can translate really beautifully into having a more confidence in walking and less worry about falls. Um, along with that, yoga also offers this additional opportunity to work on our posture. So many of the poses will help to facilitate that thoracic extension, that lifting of the chest, that kind of slight back bending action. We'll find improvements in shoulder mobility, which will help to pull those shoulders a little bit back and broaden the chest. And we even have poses that strengthen the back specifically. And then yoga's unique attention to mindfulness and the body can translate into your daily life as well, just by helping you notice the position that you are landing in. And you might just start to find yourself adjusting out of habit because you now have this built-in body awareness. Interestingly, um, stress actually plays a really big role on the bone health as well. So if you have chronic stress, that will activate your sympathetic nervous system. It'll activate the HPA access. And what that does in the long run is suppress important hormones. And those hormones will then have an effect on the bones by inhibiting the formation and increasing that resorption. So using yoga as a way to manage and monitor your stress can actually have a really beneficial effect on your bones. So I, <laughs> I'm sensing that you're all understanding a theme here about posture. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail. And I feel like everybody just straightens right up when we, when we talk about this. So um, go ahead and sit up nice and tall here and feel that broadening of the chest and maybe take a little note on how, how long you notice that you can actually hold this position comfortably as I'm chatting. So we'll, we'll talk about three things here underneath the umbrella of posture, and that's going to be mobility, stability, and strength. So that's a stepwise process that we like to follow. Um, you need the mobility before you can start working on stability. So mobility is um, kind of synonymous with range of motion. So it's the freedom of your joints themselves to move throughout good alignment. So that would be an example would be if you have reduced shoulder mobility, you can't reach overhead. Um, all the way. So we would want to improve your mobility so you can actually get the hand overhead so we can actually work on that um, axial loading. So limited mobility, of course, um, if the back of the shoulders aren't mobile, if the neck is not mobile, um, it can cause everything to kind of lean forward. So again, we want to work on uh, improving mobility and the the most important sections of the body to help with posture are going to be that overhead range of motion, neck mobility, and the extension of your thoracic spine, which is this mid back area. So next is the stability piece. So stability is the ability of your muscles to maintain the joints alignment um, despite external forces. So what that looks like, um, you know, I love this example in yoga with downward dog. If your shoulders are not very stable and they're very mobile, if you are feeling that the shoulder is kind of crunching up toward the ear, you can kind of get pinching sensations throughout the front of the shoulder. Um, there are plenty of, of examples too with weightlifting where you want to find stability in the shoulder and not just let the weight kind of hang out on your joints. So again, limited stability of the muscles around the joint can um, create the joints to be, or the bones to be in a more vulnerable position. So if you're malaligned in the spine and then you're adding external forces, you can actually potentially do a little more damage than good in certain circumstances. Um, but that's not to scare you away from the program or doing any weightlifting program on your own. Um, but for sustained posture, uh, a lot of the stabilizing sections of the body are, again, going to be the necks, 
the neck, the one neck, your hips. And uh, we also want to focus on the core, which also involves your glute muscles and your hips. So it's not just, okay, I need to stabilize my abs here. It's everything around the rib cage. It's everything around the hips and even the neck and shoulders. Um, and then we also want to pay attention to the feet. If the feet, which is your, it's your tripod, they're tripods that keep you upright. If those are unstable, the rest of that kinetic chain going up the body is also going to be unstable. So we'll pay attention to all of those things um, with the with these programs. So lastly, improving posture strength is kind of the thing that buttons up everything. So strength is the ability for the mobility and stability to be present, but you're also moving a force from one point to another. So that's kind of a fancy way of saying that, you know, you have, you're doing a bicep curl. You're able to move that weight from point A to point B. So this not only builds uh, resilient muscles, strong muscles to keep that alignment, but it also stimulates the osteoblast cells in your bones to help lay down new bone. So you kind of get a nice twofold there. Um, we want to pay special attention with regard to osteoporosis to the neck strength, the back of the shoulders, and then again, that core, including the hips. Um, and then I didn't include this here, but it would also apply to what's going on in the lower legs and the feet and ankles. Okay, all right. And then um, included in posture, we wanted to touch on the idea of chest opening. This idea I hear often in yoga, that kind of chest opening class. Um, and chest opening is this really interesting kind of movement idea that fits into all three categories. So we want to have mobility or to be able to mobilize the tissues in the front of the shoulders, so these pec muscles, so that they can move through a healthy range of motion. And then we want to find some stability and stabilize those shoulder blades on the back of the body to create this nice base of support. And then lastly, we want to strengthen the tissues on the back so that there's not this kind of tug of war happening between the front of the body being short and pulling that arm bone forward. And then you try to fix your posture. So you just draw those shoulders down, but it's really hard to hold that because you don't actually have the strength to keep your arm in that position. So actually strengthening the back of the shoulders is what leads to a kind of sustained chest opening. So it's not so much about just stretching the chest, but about finding strength in the back of the shoulders as well to make that chest opening um, sit naturally in the body instead of being something that you're kind of forcing and hugging down and into. Um, so what that might look like is just a slight difference in cueing for all, uh, some of these chest opening poses, such as like a cactus arm, instead of just kind of laying into it, you might try to pick your hand up off the floor or the wall, or just really envision the back of the shoulder kind of moving that arm bone back. So just different ways of kind of approaching poses that you probably already know and love, but just to fire up that back of the shoulder a little bit more. And then another really important thing with posture is our breathing pattern. So our breathing habits affect our posture by impacting that length tension relationship of the muscles. So that comes in if you have shallow breathing. So shallow breathing means that we're going to be using the muscles in our neck and our kind of upper shoulders more than our diaphragm and other lower muscles to find that breath. So we might be kind of breathing in this shallow pattern, which causes these muscles to work over time. They get tight and maybe pull you a little forward again. And the rib cage starts to lack mobility because it's not expanding and contracting with every breath as it hopefully should be. Um, so that proper breathing also brings stability into the core and the pelvis because we have this kind of pressure system with our breath that stabilizes the trunk. And so when we're lacking stability, we tend to actually kind of tense up and hold that tension in the body. So finding a proper breath can reduce that extra tension and bring back that mobility into the rib cage. Um, in our yoga setting, you can see this just by nature of yoga, it places a lot of emphasis on the breath. We really like to talk about a 360 breath, which we'll get into in our practice. So 360 degrees around the rib cage, breathing in, 
And then yoga has lots of different pranayama or breathing practices that really help to not only just bring your awareness to the breath, but improve your breath capacity, your ability to take a full breath and hold. And um, that can help you to move away from those shallow, shallow breathing patterns. In our strength setting, we see that we can bring awareness to the breath because certain timing of your inhales and your exhales, again, uses that stability of the breath to help make the movements easier. And that will translate into your everyday activities. Like when you have to pick up your heavy groceries, you can kind of start to fall into those positive breathing habits that you're learning from your strength training practice. And then um, moving on to our balance here, there's three things that really make up your sense of balance. So remembering that importance of the balance to reduce fall risk, we really want to start to work on that balance so that you feel confident and you can move through your day and your activities that you love. So in order to do that, we want to think about proprioception, which is our kind of internal body awareness, where we are in space, your brain is figuring that out and it's letting you know through your feet and other senses. And then we also have our visual system. So that's your eyes visually taking in where you are and then your vestibular system. And that's your inner ear and your inner ear is going to be related to your kind of head positioning. So when we look at me, um, a well-balanced, well-balanced, balanced practice, <laughs> um, we want to look at that proprioception so we can play with that by changing up the surface surface underneath our feet. So barefoot is going to give you better balance because you have kind of like a harder, firmer surface connecting to the foot. And if you want to play with that and challenge that, you could either put on shoes like squishy running shoes are a really great way to kind of challenge your balance because they actually have that kind of wobbliness and that soft um, sole. You could also just change the surface underneath your feet, whether that's putting like a foam pad, a pillow or a blanket, just something to give you something new that's going to wake up your body's awareness and just make you a little bit more of how you're positioning yourself. And then I really love myofascial release or self-massage for the feet um, as a way to improve balance because it's going to help to stimulate and wake up that body, that proprioception, that body awareness, starting right at your feet. So it's actually going to almost like um, clear the cobwebs of your brain to body map and really help you to feel your feet on the floor and be able to articulate that balance a little bit better. With your vis visual system, we can progressively challenge that first by working with the eyes open and fixed on one spot that will make balance easier. You can challenge that by keeping the eyes open, but starting to look around as you're holding a balance pose. You might just close one eye. You might try to close both eyes. Closing both eyes is really hard. If you ever even just put two feet on the floor and close your eyes, you'll probably feel yourself kind of walk on, um, like shift a little bit forward and back and then take a foot away. And you might be surprised by how hard that is. And then looking at the vestibular system, that would just be changing our head position. So not only moving our eyes, but now you're tilting your head or turning your head. And that's going to change that inner ear um, system that's kind of telling you where you are in space. And again, just challenge that balance. Um, I like to think of coordination as kind of putting all of that together. And it's a really fun way to practice balance that challenges all of those different systems. Um, so that could even just be moving between poses in your yoga practice. Um, one thing we like to do is stand on one foot and toss a ball or toss it back and forth between our two hands or between a partner so that you have that eye and head and body positioning kind of all getting challenged. But even taking it away from one leg balance, something like um, a yoga pose bird dog where you're on hands and knees and you take one arm in the opposite leg back, um, that will challenge your balance too because now you're coordinating your body in that space and that does translate into better balance standing and walking through life as well. So, oh, <laughs> I, no, oh, I thought yeah, I skipped one. Then. So <laughs> now we get to integrate all of what you just learned into an optional movement practice. So you'll get just as much benefit as watching this and practicing later. Um, but if you are more of a kinesthetic learner and like to integrate the movement into your body to learn it, um, you can go ahead and grab these pieces of equipment and it's completely like you probably won't have a weight vest. 
Uh, but if you do great, you can grab that. And then if you don't have dumbbells, you could easily grab a couple of soup cans out of your cupboard. Um, so we're actually going to get set up um, and we'll give you a couple of moments to gather those pieces of equipment if you'd like to join us. Um, if you are participating, we will do one balance exercise. So I would suggest being next to something um, like a wall or a couch that's very sturdy and not going to slide on the floor. Um, if you find that your balance is typically a little wobbly. Okay. And it says long resistance band here, but you can also um, sub that in for a yoga strap or like Yenny said, even like your dog's leash, that's totally fine. Just something that's long. Um, and if you don't even have that, don't worry, we have an option for you. So I'm gonna end the screen share and plug this in. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. So we're transitioning to the practice portion, which, uh, as Michaela and Sarah said, you're welcome to participate in or just watch and observe. Um, just as a time check, Michaela and Sarah, it is 1236 right now. And I'm just going to give everybody a couple of minutes to get set up if they want to practice. And let's also do a quick audio check when you guys have switched to your headset mic there. All right, Annie, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so everybody can hop in whenever they are ready with their items. So I'm just turning the chair to the side so you can get the perspective of what I'm typically looking at in the clinic when we're doing our assessments. So Michaela is my wonderful volunteer patient, if you'll have a seat. So the reason why I asked for a chair with a tall back is so that the back can come right up against the chair so that there's not any compensations happening in the thoracic spine, so that mid-back. So in a typical posture assessment, I'll ask her to, to rest the soles of the feet flat on the ground, no crossing the legs. And then if you could turn the palms up so that we're in better shoulder blade position. So what I'm looking at, and before I even say anything, is the alignment of the inner ears, that hole that you put the Q-tip in your ear um, is over this bony prominence of the shoulder. And that those two points where they're related to the position of the bony part of the hip. And if she were standing, I would also look at those points and how they align with the bony part of the ankle. So this is called the plumb line. And you could even take a picture of yourself from a side view and check it out, see what your position is. And a lot of the times, if Michaela will let her head come forward, we might notice that the ear is actually a little more forward. And in more severe cases, the shoulder might be rounded and hunched forward, leading to this kyphotic posture, a rounded posture of that mid back. So you can rest in a comfortable position now. Thank you. And then a uh, corrective exercise. Um, it's kind of on, it makes my for life exercise list. And I do give it to a lot of patients. Um, I try to do it pretty regularly and they're called cervical retractions. So we have these little neck muscles that basically keep our 15 pound heads on average stacked on top of our bodies. So when the head is forward, those poor little muscles are strained and they just tense up and tighten. So if you have a lot of knots here, you might want to check in with strengthening those muscles. So the retraction is that if you could pretend like somebody was putting their hand behind your head and you're trying to push back into it, it's a very subtle movement, but she, see how she's stacking her ear over her shoulder now. And then hopefully she can feel some strengthening happening in those muscles there. Um, and then to deepen that exercise, she can actually pull all the way back. Yeah. So notice that it's not a chin tucked down. It's the head going straight back. One of my patients called this the don't kiss me face. And I think it really sticks with people. Um, so, so the don't kiss me face exercise, and you could do 10 or two rounds of 10 building up once a day for those. And then if we could actually turn the chair to face our audience. So the next thing to kind of build on that posture uh, component is an exercise that I like to do that's called the posture reset. So if you sit down in a chair, you scooch up to the edge of the chair so that your arms don't hit the back this time. 
and she'll separate her feet a little bit. And then if you could lace the fingers together and then you'll push the palms down toward the ground and then inhale to flip the palms up toward the sky. So hold for a moment here and then add in that little retraction. It's a good place to practice that. And then you can exhale, keeping the retraction, letting the hands come down by their side. Good. So that's one. And then you can go that, through that five to 10 times. So this is a good exercise to practice uh, breathing, your retractions. It's really great if you've been driving for a long time, sitting, or you're sitting down at your computer, uh, working for a prolonged period of time. I usually tell people to break away from their computers every half hour and just do 10 of these. Okay. Thank you. And then next uh, is that 360 breath. So this is where you can go ahead and grab your yoga strap, dog leash, resistance bands, and I will give you a moment to do that, but you're going to take your item and wrap it around the rib cage so that you're crisscrossing both ends of that strap just underneath the bra line, so that nipple line. And then I like to tell people to turn their palms up just so you can kind of cinch it up a little bit better and not put any unwanted pressure on the wrist and shoulders, okay? So maintaining that nice, cervical retraction and the don't kiss me face. And then she is breathing into that band or uh, dog leash yoga strap all the way around 360 degrees. So when, she, and it's a little difficult to see her doing this, but what I'm looking for is to make sure that she's not using these accessory muscles in the neck. So not using these side of the neck muscles to elevate the shoulders, right? So she's doing a really good job keeping those relaxed. And then also if you could see, and you could look at yourself in the mirror, that the expansion is coming more from the ribs. If you don't have access to a prop like this, you can simply use your hands. So just kind of cradling that web space on the sides. Yeah. And then using that as a little bit of a pressure point to breathe into. So with this one, I usually tell people to try to breathe into a count of three and exhale to a count of five so that you can establish a little more control of the breath. And that also helps to stimulate the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that runs down to our heart and helps with that rest and digest that relaxation piece. Okay. So yeah, about 10 of those, um, whenever you're feeling like you need a little reset. Good. Thank you. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. Now we can speak a little bit about um, yoga. So in, I think the most important piece in yoga is that we're being more cautious of forward folding. So if you have a couple of yoga blocks, this would be a good place to grab those. So in a typical yoga class, you could have the blocks up on their tall side and I'll get out of Michaela's way here. So she's going to inhale to sweep the arms up overhead and then exhale to hinge forward at the hips, maybe a little soft bend in the knees and notice how her spine stays very long here. So what we are not looking for is rounding into a forward fold. So again, she's keeping the spine lifted. And then also if you're feeling like you want to go down a little bit further to get more of a stretch behind the legs, you can take the fingertips or the knuckles up onto your blocks just to give your chest a little lift. And she's doing a great job of keeping a little bit of that retraction here in the neck. So she has a long line from the top of the head down to the tailbone. Okay. So, and then you can come on up. Nice job. Thank you. So that is a very common practice in yoga. So this is just a simple modification that you can bring into your normal classes. Um, any yoga teacher should just kind of allow you to, to do that, knowing that you have autonomy over your own practice. Um, so you don't need the permission from the yoga teacher to implement those poses and classes. Okay. So Taking that same principle, we're going to come down onto the floor. So seated forward fold is another place where this concept exists. So before she, so what we don't want her to do is a rounding forward. Oh God, how, how low can I get my nose to my knees? That's not the point here. The point here in this pose is to find a nice lengthening happening in your hamstrings. So those muscles behind the thighs. Yeah. So what she is going to do is draw in from the navel, create a long line through the spine, lift through the top of the head. And then she's going to hinge at the hips, 
leading with the chest. And you'll notice she doesn't go down as far, but I'm almost convinced that she can feel quite a stretch in her hamstrings. Uh, that's not a guided question either. <laughs> and then to come out of this, she'll simply draw the navel into the spine to unhinge the hips to come up. So yeah, just avoiding that forward flexed position in this pose. Okay. So then <clears throat> Coming into another common pose is our half spinal twist. So you can pick either side, Michaela, and just bend a knee, crisscross that foot over the knee, and then go ahead and wrap your left arm around the shin. And then you're finding um, that in this pose, you might want to recline into that back hand, but look at what that just did to her spine. So we're getting this rounding happening in that upper back. And then if she's twisting, that's actually putting... Um, a disadvantage to that stability of the joints in the spine and not actually creating that tensile loading in a safe way. So the back hand is actually just meant to act as a little kickstand. She should be so active in her core that she could lift that back hand up and not fall back. Yay. <laughs> So again, here you can practice cervical retraction. And then in this pose, as you inhale, you're lengthening. And as you exhale, you come into that twist just a touch more. Okay. And then the same thing you would repeat on the other side to even out. Okay. So this is actually a pose that is in um, that that survey and study that Michaela discussed, the Lauren Fishman 12 poses for your uh, osteoporosis. So if you do look that one up, I would say that that is probably one of the biggest takeaways for that sequence to pay attention to. Okay. So then next we have our prone locus. So this is more of a strengthening posture and one of our favorites, which is also in the 12 poses. So you're going to come to rest on your belly. And of course there are different versions of this pose, but the one that we like is to take the hands down by your side, forehead on the mat. And then <clears throat> she's going to first gather the shoulder blades together toward the spine. So that's called retracting the shoulder blades. Okay. And then she's going to give a little retraction of the neck, lifting the head and then lift the hands up off the ground and then the feet. So this pose, and you can come down anytime you need to, Michaela, is not about how high you can get off the ground. It's actually about how much can you relax the low back, but also keep the shoulder blades strong. So this is a posture exercise right now. And um, she is doing a wonderful job with maintaining this. And then to, to release from this, you just want to come down with control. And then you can go ahead and put the hands under the shoulders or under the forehead just to rest and relax. So even though <clears throat> by making those changes and relaxing the low back, your chest might come a little closer to the ground. And that's completely fine. Just as long as you're feeling the strengthening happening between those shoulder blades. Okay. So hopefully everybody who is practicing with us is kind of following along. I apologize if I'm going too fast, but this is the part of the practice where we'll come to stand and you're going to grab your squishy surface. So either a pillow or a yoga bolster. And if you are feeling a little unstable or wobbly, this is where you would want to have something to hold on to just to give you a little additional support. So do you need additional support? Okay. <laughs> so you're going to put your, yeah, <laughs> maybe today's the day. <laughs> So for testing our balance or actually challenging the balance, you can come to stand on your squishy surface and this might be more than enough. You might feel a little bit wobbly here. So what this is doing is challenging your proprioception. So that concept of knowing where your body is in space, you have these little um, mechanoreceptors in the ligaments of your feet and actually throughout the whole body that sends a sensory message to the brain that says, wow, I need to recover from this um, environmental disruption. So she's doing a great job because she's standing upright. <laughs> Good job. So then next we want to challenge the visual so this is where things could get a little tricky. So she can go ahead and close her eyes. And after about, maybe even right away, but I find after about 10 seconds is where people really start to kind of sway back and forth. If you're feeling very wobbly, you can open up one eye. And of course, open both if you're not feeling safe. Okay. 
Good. So she's doing great. And the recommended dose for this is holding for 30 seconds. So if you can build up to that, maybe set a timer, that would be great. Just again, making sure that you're next to something. So you're feeling supported and safe. Um, and then to challenge the vestibular system. So the inner ear, she can close her eyes and do some head movements, but we won't do that today. So she's going to either tilt the head from side to side or rotate from side to side, or she could even look up and down. Yeah, good. And of course, the third layer to this would be to close the eyes. So now we're challenging visual, vestibular, and proprioception. So as you can see, this is kind of a dynamic um, type of exercise where we can plug and pull to make different challenges. Okay, so you can go ahead and step off of that. And just to... Um, translate this into yoga. The most common example that you'll see in yoga is going to be your tree pose. And that's where you can practice some of those principles, um, maybe closing the eyes or moving the head. Um, and then we could also practice our balance in any split leg position. So what that looks like is our warrior one, sorry, <laughs> our warrior one. Yeah yoga instructor kicks in and doesn't go away. <laughs> so you can see her feet are nice and wide and any person could experience a little bit of wobbliness here. I do find that in these split foot positions that if you keep your feet on railroad tracks, meaning they're more side by side, rather than bringing them into midline like Michaela just did, uh, where one foot is kind of right in front of the other seat. And it does make you a little more wobbly if you're in a position where you feel like you're more on a tight rope. So good. Thank you. And then warrior two would also be another example of this. Yeah. Good. And then any lunge um, that you're in that split foot position. So again, she's finding her railroad tracks. She's coming to bring the hips down and the lower she gets to the ground, the more she gets away from her center of gravity, the more wobbly she might feel. And then lastly, if you come down into a tabletop to do a, what's called bird dog. So tabletop and then lengthening from the top of the head to the tailbone. If she extends the left leg out long and the right hand up, overhead. This also works on the balance just as much as the core. So, and then you can go ahead and release. Thank you. So you don't think of this pose as maybe being something that works on the balance, but it's a really good one to bring into your practice. And again, just noting that those um, ankle wobbles are actually a good thing and they're doing their job. Those muscles are keeping you upright. So give that idea a little bit of love the next time you're on your mat or doing some exercises. Okay. So let's move on to our strength piece of the practice. So for this, you'll need your weight vest if you have them and your couple of weights. Um, and if you don't have those, that's completely fine. You can watch. So we want to go ahead and demonstrate First, how to put on and take off a weight vest should you decide that you want to get one yourself. On average, we um, suggest that people start with a 16 pound weight vest, but we've honestly had people start with five to six pounds and gradually build their way up. And you can get your weight vest on Amazon if you have any questions about what type of uh, weight vest to get. We could give you some suggestions for that. But if Michaela wants to pick up her weight vest very safely, keeping the chest up, very good. So you don't want to round forward and load that spine. So if she's just carrying the weight vest to and from her car, or maybe going up the stairs to do her workout, she's keeping it in the crease of her elbow and holding it close to the body. If you're holding it down by your side, you're tilting, and that's not really healthy or safe for the spine. So then putting this on, she's kind of putting it on just like a backpack. So sliding one hand in and then the other. And uh, for these weight vests that we typically recommend, they're filled with little like iron beads. So they're kind of sandy. Mm -hmm. And if the back has a pocket, it's almost like this mesh type pocket here. You would just want to make sure that that's upright. And then also a lot of the vests are branded. So you could just make sure that the names are up top. 
in the right position. And then the reason for that is the elastic band that is on here. You don't want that up top because it can kind of bounce and move around on your body. Um, so with that being said, after she buckles it up, she wants to make sure that she can fit two fingers nice and easily underneath the top straps. And then same thing for down on the bottom straps. So if you're feeling like it's too tight, um, it can compress on some nerve structures or lymphatic structures um, in the breast tissue or in the um, brachial plexus. So this whole nerve system that's coming out of the neck and down into the arms. And with that being said, any numbness tingling in the hands, take it off right away. Okay. So now that you have your weight vest on safe and none, none of those things are happening, we'll go over um, probably one of the most common exercises that we use is the squat. So we'll kind of go through a little sequence here and show you what a progression might look like for that. So if we turn this to the side and if Michaela comes to stand in front of the chair here, so showing you from the side view here, it's a little easier to understand what we're talking about. So she wants to get the feet hips distance apart, maybe even a little wider, clasp the hands in front of the heart. And then she's going to sit back and we use the chair so that she gets her bottom back enough and then come on up. So a lot of times we actually see the bottom not going back too far and the knees go over the toes. So that's what we don't want to happen and see what happens when she's down in that position. And then she sticks her bottom back. Now the knees come behind the toes. We get better loading in the quads and lengthening in those glutes. Okay. So then you can come on up. And then after you get the hang of that, you can move the chair away and she could do 10 body weight squats. So you don't have to do all 10, but just to see what it looks like without the chair. And of course, going down at a range that feels comfortable and safe for you. If you're getting any knee pain, it's fine to keep your squat shallow. Okay. Um, and then if we wanted to progress this, she's going to pick up her weight nice and safely, keeping the spine long, and then you can hold this in the goblet position. So what this looks like is almost like she's holding a little chalice in between her hands. And this is nice because she can lift her chest up into the weight to keep that posture piece, but then also wanting to keep the rib cage hugged down so that you're bracing the core. And then you can go ahead and take your wide stance and come down into your round of squats. So what this is doing is um, progressing you to use your posture. And you're also, of course, adding more weight. So we're getting that loading through the spine, through the hips. Good. Okay. Wonderful. And of course, this can be progressed with a barbell if we're getting pretty serious. Um, and then, you know, eventually adding weight on the barbell. Okay. So other exercises with the weight vest could be things like, um, walking is, is quite simple. So you can take your vest out for a walk. You can go for five minutes and then turn around and come back. If you feel like that was a comfortable, uh, duration of time for you, then you could go eight minutes the next time and gradually build up. Just remember the distance that you go. You also have to walk back with your weight vest. So plan ahead for that. So you don't get stuck. Okay. And then uh, another one that we really like. So if you have a set of dumbbells, you can grab and put down by your side. So this is a heel drop. So you could even do this without the weights, but with the weight vest on and that additional force, you'll get more ground reaction, that vibration coming up through the heels and stimulating the bones of the spine and the hips. So if Michaela comes up onto her toes and then kind of drops down on the heels and then lifts up again, down on the heels. We usually start about five to 10 reps of these and build up to 15, but hopefully you can kind of feel that vibration coming up through the body. Uh, but just know that you're not dropping down so hard that you're almost bruising your heels. Um, we don't want any issues in those bony parts of the feet. Okay. Um, you might also feel that the calves are kind of burning. So if you're feeling that, um, just back off of the repetitions as you start and gradually build up. Okay. So wonderful. You can go ahead and put those down and then our last one optional to do this with the weight vest on having the weight vest on for this one doesn't really change what the upper body is doing. 
Um, so if Michaela wants to have a seat here, and then this would be a good one to use maybe lighter weights to start. So typically we start with five pounds and then gradually build up to about 10 to 15. So an overhead press is going to give you the axial loading that you need through the spine and putting weight through the shoulders and even down into the hips. So this is a great one. So coming into a racked position. So that just means that you're racking the dumbbells up toward. Okay. So then from the front here, Michaela is going to try to keep the forearms parallel throughout this entire movement. So it almost feels like you're squishing everything together. That's going to stabilize the shoulder, right? And then draw the navel in toward the spine so that you're supporting and stabilizing the spine. And then exhale as you push up to the sky, biceps. So those upper arms come to frame the ear. And then she slowly comes back down to that start position. So she could do anywhere from six to 10 repetitions of these. Uh, and then again, gradually building up. And you'll notice here as she's up here, maybe the shoulders might be shrugged up toward the ears. So when she comes up, even though she's reaching up overhead, she's going to drop the shoulders away from the ears. Good. All right. Nice job. How are you feeling? Good. Uh, the only thing with the weight press is it might. Yes. Uh, Cut it. Yeah. So Michaela is feeling this in this, in this exercise that if you do this with the weight vest on, it might compress in the, sh in the neck and shoulders. So you might want to take this one off for that exercise. Okay. Um, and then that also reminds me, we get this question often is sitting with a weight vest, um, enough, um, it could be, it could be, but we don't recommend it because you need to be able to hold your posture up. If your head and shoulders start to come forward, you're getting that rounding, but then you also have this additional weight on that's going to pull you forward even more and kind of perpetuate this cycle that we're trying to avoid. So I would say if you're going to do things around the house, you're doing things like dishes, going up and down the stairs. Um, and when I say dishes, I don't mean bending over to load the dishwasher. I mean, actually standing at the counter to do your dishes. Okay. Um, so if you have questions about that, we're happy to answer, but you can go ahead and take your vest off. And that concludes our movement um, portion of this seminar. So we can slide over into any Q and A's and answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michaela and Sarah. That was super informative. Um, we have time for questions. So anything that has popped up for you, um, either in a more general sense about osteoporosis or things relating specifically to um, what you heard or saw during the lecture portion um, or the practical portion, then just drop that into the chat and we'll be happy to answer those questions. And I just wanted to also say how incredibly useful it is to sort of understand um, what's actually happening with osteoporosis exactly like you guys explained about the body that front part of the of the vertebra is the one that becomes um, the the most kind of vulnerable um, and how the suboptimal posture and loading uh, excessively in that suboptimal posture can uh, create problems down the line and it makes it a lot easier to understand how a lot of the exercises that you demonstrated are actually going to help to counter that because not only are you in that more optimal alignment but then you're able to load and uh, build strength and capacity and functionality in that new in that new position that better better alignment um, okay, so we have some questions. Um, uh, Lisa says this was so informative and exceptional. This program is amazing. Thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, Lisa is actually in our pilot program right now. So she um, is doing the program that we are fine tuning right now. Yeah. Um, thanks, Lisa. Um, Joanne is asking whether bone density, uh, can bone density be improved in menopausal women or is it only seen prior to menopause? That's a great question. So a lot of the uh, participants that we have in our in-person program um, actually came to us out of frustration of having a diagnosis already. So these are women who have already gone through menopause and recently received their DEXA scans and are kind of at a loss because they don't want to take the medications. Um, and in which case we have seen those people two years later show improvements or at least maintenance of their bone density, which is very exciting and, and extremely helpful. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, and Laura is asking if you could point her to resources on how to use the wait vest. Did you have a video that we? Um, I, we have a video included in our program. I don't know if um, that's something we could offer out. Um, as far as resources, I'm not <laughs> sure of any like right off the bat. But um, if you want to just maybe remember this part of the recording or take a quick note, um, the key things with the weight vest are really being mindful of that forward folding. I feel like we're such a broken record, but I hope that means it's <laughs> getting ingrained in you. Um, so when you wear that weight vest or even carrying that weight vest around, you just want to be really mindful of that kind of forward folding position so that you're not loading that front of the vertebral body. And then as far as exercises, when you're wearing that weight vest, like Sarah said, pretty much anything where you're maintaining a pretty neutral spine um, is a great thing to do. So if you're a walker, walking is just a phenomenal way. You're already walking. You can just add that right in. Um, or you can move through certain exercises like this. I love the squat because it's um, not only a great way to add load to the squat without having to hold an extra heavy dumbbell or worry about moving a really heavy dumbbell around because I know with an osteo diagnosis, you might be worried about picking up and moving that dumbbell around. So you can get away with a slightly lighter dumbbell, but then still get the load. Um, and then anything um, balance related can be a fun one to do with the with the uh, weight vest on because you're already in a pretty neutral spine. So it's just an opportunity to kind of like stack those two exercises on top of each other. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Um, somebody's asking, uh, they would love your opinion on infusions like reclass or reclass. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Yeah. Reclass. Um, I've heard people, you know, the thing with any, any medication, and I'm certainly not a pharmacist or a, a medical doctor who could steer you a little bit better in the direction of what you need to go for that route. Um, people have had a lot of success with medications. Um, so, you know, it's, I can't speak on that because it's so individual and it and it depends on your unique situation. Um, so that truly is something that you might want to discuss with your medical doctor, OBGYN. Um, it would be nice to get an endocrinologist in on the discussion too. Um, but whether or not you're taking medications, these strength training pieces and the yoga pieces can still help to supplement um, those benefits. Um, but I would say just, <clears throat> you know, from a, from a medical standpoint, but also a, a friend standpoint, you want to have autonomy over what you're putting in your body, of course. And it sounds like all of you, you know, you're here, you want to learn, um, about these different options. So just make sure that you're looking up what those potential side effects can be so that you can be prepared to, to have those discussions with your doctor and choose the best thing for you. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer because there are so going to be so many individual variables that are unique to everybody's situation. So um, it's going to come down to whatever combination of variables um, you yourself happen to be to be dealing with. Um, Maria has a great question. She's asking with the forward fold, um, trying to keep the spine straight. Do you bend the knees or stop before you need to? Ooh, that is a great yeah, question. Um, I could speak on that, but if you want to also yeah. add your opinion. Um, so with the forward fold, uh, so if you are truly keeping that spine straight, I feel like we could do a whole workshop on this. <laughs> um, but if you bend the knees because of the fact that you're trying to reduce, basically you're trying to shorten the hamstrings so that you're you're not overstretching them or if it's uncomfortable, um, that's completely fine. You still get some benefits um, of stretching those hamstrings. Um, and then, yes, you would stop before you, you my little mantra is um, go to the pain, not through the pain. So, if you can apply that, um, and you know, we're saying like pain being too much of a stretch. So just knowing how to differentiate between those two concepts in your body. Is there anything you wanted to add on to that? Um, I'm pretty much right in line with you. I would say, um, bending the knees is like Sarah says, going to give you a little bit of slack in the hamstring. So if that feels like it's a really limiting factor. It's just going to offer you a little bit more like room to work with. Um, so you can certainly bend the knees or you might just not fold forward as much, but I would say just 
kind of experiment, maybe try both and then see which one feels like it's giving you a better sensation or more um, benefit. It feels more productive in your body because that is going to be really individual person to person. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess as with most other things in this instance, there's always going to be that balance between you want to apply some meaningful uh, tension and load into the structures like that a little bit of intensity is not something to be afraid of or something that's bad because it actually means that you're uh, loading loading the structures in some capacity but especially in this kind of scenario when there are some um, specific considerations to be taken into account then we just want to make sure we're not pushing it so it's always like Kind of balancing between between the two, like you want to be doing something, you just don't want to be doing too much so that it becomes counter counterproductive. So I think productive intensity is like a phrase that I've heard some people um, use in in general, which might be like a good uh, subjective <laughs> gauge to come back to. Yeah. Um, Kim is asking whether you would recommend a particular weight vest, like a style of weight vest. Yeah, let me go grab the one that we typically recommend. Um, so like I said, so this is this vest up close and it is kind of like soft and floppy, which is really nice, um, especially for women. And, you know, you don't want hard things pressing on the breast tissue, especially while you're exercising, you want comfort. Um, what I like about this weight vest is that the weight is pretty evenly distributed around the entire body. So again, we're trying to um, promote that full, well-rounded um, pressure that's being placed on the spine. So this um, particular brand is peak resistance, but if you go on Amazon, um, I find that this, this style exists across multiple brands. So you could typically find one for yourself and we could even include this in a follow-up email maybe. Yeah, or you're welcome to pop it in the chat as well and people can grab the information sure. from there. Yeah. yeah. And um, while one of you is doing that, maybe the other can answer a really good question from Bev. She weighs a hundred pounds. How heavy should her weight vest be for her? Oh, that's a great question. We actually have um, another woman who is about that uh, weight in our program. And she has actually worked herself up to using a 16 pound, but we did start her, uh, she was starting at a six pound weight vest. So it is a little, a little frustrating that you might have to um, maybe purchase another weight vest later on down the road. Um, but it's perfectly fine to start on the lower end of things, maybe between six to 10 pounds. Um, but I think the more important thing to know is that as you start to wear the weight vest, um, most people don't wear it for longer than 10 minutes. They really start to feel the effects of it. And you'll notice that maybe over the course of two to three weeks, you could start to um, feel stronger wearing it. So you can increase the duration of time. Yeah. And I guess as with everything else, you're kind of going to be feeling it out and gauging what feels productive for you and then gradually building, building from there. Thanks, Michaela. So there is a link to their recommended uh, weight vest in the, in the chat now for anybody that wants to grab that. Um, and then Paulina had a great question. Um, does taking a vitamin D supplement help to prevent osteoporosis? So vitamin D will definitely have an effect on the bones. Um, it's hard to say if just some supplementing with vitamin D will be enough to prevent osteoporosis. Um, it kind of depends on what your diet looks like in general. Um, and then there's also vitamin D works with vitamin K2 and other vitamins in the body to actually kind of lay that, that bone, bring the calcium into the bone. Um, so I, I definitely think vitamin D is a, a good supplement for most people to take, especially if you live in the Northern hemisphere and you're not going to be getting it through the sun all year round. Um, or if you just don't get outside very often or as much as maybe ideally you could, um, enough to prevent, I can't really say for sure, but I don't think like, as long as it's clear with your doctor and everything like that, I think it's a, it's a good supplement to take for most people. Yeah, and probably useful to add in there that it's going to be like such a multifactorial thing too, because 
you know, we, we do know that bones like bony tissue responds to uh, loading, same as every other tissue in our body, like the ways in which we stress our bodies, the body is going to respond to that and strengthen in accordance with the ways that it's being, being stressed or not stressed. <laughs> so in, inactivity is a form of loading uh, as well, or just an, just an absence of, of loading. So, um, and with bone specifically, I think you guys mentioned the fact that, um, they really respond to compression and impact. So the, that's the addition of external load, whether it's with the weight vest or holding like dumbbells while you're, while you're doing these movements and then, um, impact like Michaela was demonstrating the heel drops, which are actually giving a little bit of shock like and i feel like there's um been a narrative and in, like in for for a long time now about how like things like running like destroy your knees and actually that's not that's not like not everybody is going to respond well to running but as an overarching statement that's not really a helpful one because actually the impact of something like your feet hitting the ground is stimulating the bones in in a helpful way um so i think we should, we shouldn't forget that aspect of it too, that, you know, the nutrition part of it is important, but then, um, we need to physically use our body in order to like retain and enhance their capacity as well. So there's going to be, there's going to be different, different factors contributing in, um, Sylvia, nice to leave. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, <clears throat> um, Paulina says, thank you as well. This was very informative. She's going to try to take steps to prevent osteoporosis. Um, and Lisa commented also that she has not been given a diagnosis of osteoporosis, but she's 61 and trying to prevent it. So, uh, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about, um, that, like the taking preemptive action. I love that. <laughs> prevention, prevention, prevention. And to be honest, I feel like these discussions should really be starting when women are going through puberty like these these things really should be emphasized a little bit more in, in health class in my opinion um because what you your your bone density actually peaks at 30 years of age and that peak bone density depends on how much exercise and what nutrition uh you've cultivated for yourself within those first you know 30 years of your life um so Yes. So trying to prevent osteoporosis, even though you don't have the diagnosis is wonderful because, um, well, there's two other things that I wanted to comment on overall is that if you are over the age of 40 and your OBGYN or your primary care physician hasn't suggested, uh, getting a DEXA scan, advocate for yourself and see if you can get a DEXA scan because chances are things are starting to decrease at that point. And then uh, typically insurance allows you to get a follow-up DEXA scan every two years. We find that changes really do happen within those two years, um, better or worse, you know, depending on, on your lifestyle and stress and nutrition and all of those things. Um, so it is important to stay on top of it. So if she's 61 now without osteoporosis and she's doing these things to benefit her body, when she's 80 years old, the likelihood of her not having osteoporosis increases. Awesome. Um, and I think that's a good place to start wrapping it up. Uh, Desiree says, thank you so much for the great information and exercises to assist with our health journey. Desiree, thank you so much for, for being here. And I'm super glad you found this useful. Um, Beth says, thank you so much. This was super helpful and informative, and I'm looking forward to learning more about the program. So this is a great segue into our final little bit of info that I that I want to add in here is that you'll all be getting that follow up email from us um, after the seminar this afternoon. It's going to have the recording um, of the session. It's for you to use however you want, including passing on the link to somebody else that you know who might who might benefit from it. And um, <laughs> As uh, Lisa just mentioned, um, yeah, full disclosure, she's Sarah's mother-in-law, but she's participating in um, our pilot program uh, right now, the Strength Training and Yoga for Osteoporosis program, uh, which we're fine-tuning and tweaking for launch in early 2023. So if you found this session interesting and relevant and useful for you, and you'd like to find out more details about its uh, eventual launch in just a couple of months, then signing up for our newsletter is going to be your, your best bet. You can follow us on Instagram. Um, and all of these links are going to be included in the in the follow up email. And just to give you a little bit more information,
information about the program itself. So we wanted to expand their reach because Michaela and Sarah are doing such fantastic work locally with their with their clients. And their problem is that they actually cannot get rid of their clients because all of them love the program so much that they stay in it. So they never have any free client spots <laughs> opening up. So that's why we're partly turning this program into a digital format where anybody anywhere in the world can use it and participate. It's digitally delivered, but includes a live in-person component so that you're getting face-to-face -face time on Zoom with Michaela and Sarah at regular intervals throughout the program. And there's a community aspect of it. Um, as they mentioned, it's so helpful and important to be with a cohort of people who are going through the program with you and who are experiencing and dealing with um, like a similar situation to yours in their lives as well. So that community support is huge. And um, that's something that we really wanted to provide as part of the program too. So um, that, that those are just some of the the features that we wanted to build in to to make this um hopefully as as good as possible for everybody so um, if you would like more information, then just uh, be on the lookout for that follow-up email, and you'll have the option there to sign up for our newsletter as well, uh, which is probably the best way um, to to stay in stay in touch with us and um, to to get more updates. Um, you can also just hit reply on the email that you'll get from us later, and uh, that will come directly to us as well. Um, oh, and Lisa also mentioned that, yes, the, so the program is uh, entirely interactive, uh, which means that you're never just kind of like left alone uh, dealing with things yourself, but you do, uh, Michaela and Sarah are there for you on a daily basis um, for interaction and support if any questions um, come up, which is uh, another feature of all of our, uh, of our, of our programming where um, it's never like, here's your program, have fun, uh, let's hope it works out, but we were there kind of supporting you the, the whole way through. Um, all right, so as these things sometimes tend to, we've gone over time just because there's been so much good <laughs> information to share and so many excellent uh, uh, and insightful questions from you guys. So um, I wanna thank all of you for being here and sharing some of your uh, Saturday with us. I wanna thank Michaela and Sarah for sharing their expertise and their insights as well. Um, and yeah, we will see you all out somewhere on the on the internet. <laughs> You're welcome to get in touch with us um, in any any way at any time, and we we're here to help and support you guys. So thank you again for for everybody being here. Wishing you a wonderful rest of your day and your weekend, and um, we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.